Hi. So today I'm going to talk about um, AI and the nature of mind. And I'm going to start by reading you a thought experiment from the beginning of my new book, um, Artificial You, AI, and the Future of Your Mind. It's 2045, and today you're at shopping. Your first stop is the Center for Mind Design. And as you walk in, a large menu stands before you. It lists brain enhancements with funky names. Hive Mind is a brain chip allowing you to experience the innermost thoughts of your loved ones. Zen Garden is a microchip for Zen master level meditative states. Human Calculate gives you savant level mathematical skills. What would you select, if anything? Enhanced attention? Mozart level musical abilities? You can order a single enhancement or a bundle of several. So today's talk um, concerns the future of the mind. So it'll, it, it'll be about how our understanding of ourselves, our minds and our nature can change the future for better or worse. Today, in this short time that we have, I'll ask you, at a place like the Center for Mind Design, could you truly merge with artificial intelligence? So here's a roadmap for today's talk. First, I'll discuss some background issues transhumanism, neurotechnology, and age-old philosophical questions. Secondly, I'll talk about design ceilings on AI-based brain enhancement. And finally, I'll conclude with some discussion based on my work with NASA um, about our place in the cosmos, AI, and the road ahead. Okay, so background. So, as you know, the evolution of the brain was obviously constrained by environmental, anatomical, and metabolic demands. However, AI-based brain enhancement technologies could, at least in principle, augment intelligence at a rate that's much quicker than biological evolution. I call this exciting new enterprise mind design. Mind design, upon reflection, is actually a kind of intelligent design, but we, not some god, purport to be the designers. Well, bearing that in mind, I find the prospect of mind design humbling because frankly, we humans aren't terribly evolved. We walk the moon, we harness the energy of the atom, yet racism, greed, and violence are all too common. Our social development seems to lag behind our technological prowess. So it's a good idea to start thinking about brain enhancement now. So now I want to bring you back to the Center for Mind Design. I'm going to change the thought experiment a little. Suppose as you stand in line, someone comes up to you who works there and they're chatting you up and they whisper a secret that's coming out. They say, look, if clinical trials go as planned, customers will soon be able to purchase an enhancement bundle called Merge. That's a series of enhancements that allows you to gradually augment and then transfer all of your mental functions to the cloud over a period of five years. So let me ask you, could you really merge with AI in this way? Before I answer, um, I have a few preliminary issues. Now I'm a philosopher. So um, what I first wanna ask is what is it to even talk about merging with AI? What does that mean? And secondly, isn't this a little too speculative to worry about? So first, a little more on the expression merging with AI. Transhumanism has been talking about this for years. So some of you may have read, say, the work of Ray Kurzweil. Um, and transhumanists argue that humans can overcome their biological limitations through science and technology. And they offer the following trajectory for enhancement, which is pretty radical. They say, you start with an unenhanced human like us, and over time, as the technology develops, that person um, could, if they wish, engage in significant upgrading with cognitive and other physical enhancements. And if they continue upgrading, they will eventually become post-human, a being that's no longer technically human. Then, over time, as they replace their biological neural circuitry with artificial circuitry, there's a point at which they actually become more synthetic than natural. In fact, they become what is called superintelligent artificial intelligence. So superintelligence, 
has been in the news a lot lately with people like um, Bill Gates and Elon Musk talking about worries that super intelligence could outthink us. Super intelligent AI is a hypothetical form of AI that by definition is said to outthink humans in every way possible, scientific reasoning, social skills, and more. So this is the rough trajectory of a lot of people um, who are influential in the AI community. Um, so for example, Elon Musk, Nick Bostrom, who heads the Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford, uh, transhumanist leaders like uh, Natasha Vitamore, Ray Kurzweil, um, and you know, public figures like the late Stephen Hawking and Michio Keku. Um, so this view has become very influential. Now, here's an important note because we only have 20 minutes. So I just want to underscore exactly what I'm talking about today. I'm most interested in the kind of brain enhancement, which is very radical. Transhumanists say that these kinds of enhancements that lead them to super intelligence will increasingly involve actually replacing parts of the biological brain with AI components. I'm not after other kinds of enhancements. Maybe coffee's an enhancement. I sure like to drink a lot of it and maybe it does help me pay attention. I'm not going to refute the idea of coffee, God no. Okay, so I'm just talking about these more radical forms. Now, this is awfully speculative, so why deal with it today? Well, transhumanism is a very influential view, as I've just mentioned. I encountered it a lot in Washington, D.C. when I was NASA chair working with Congress on AI policy. A lot of members um, hear a lot about transhumanism because the tech leaders have these views and they meet with the tech leaders. Um, also, as a philosopher, um, it touches on a classic and important philosophical issue that you've probably thought of. Does consciousness transcend the brain? We've been thinking about this for, you know, since gosh, the pre-Socratic Greeks, but now we're thinking about the issue in a technological guise, which fascinates me. And as a cognitive scientist, I've noted in previous books that there's this sort of informal paradigm, if you will, when it comes to thinking of the brain, it's that the brain is computational. And that often inspires the philosophical view that is held by a lot of cognitive scientists that the mind is something like a software program that the brain runs. And I talk about that view and respond to it in chapter six of my book. Finally, you might think this is speculative, but we shouldn't commit what the historian Michael Best calls the Jetsons fallacy. So I don't know if you remember the cartoon, The Jetsons, you probably remember Star Wars. So in both cases, notice that AI had transformed the world, but it hadn't changed anything about the characters. They were unenhanced. So that's actually, according to Michael Best, a sort of fallacy, if you will, because in reality, AI won't just change the world, it will change us. It will go inside the human head. And indeed, that is what we're seeing. So for example, Elon Musk has said that um, humans need to keep up with AI by having, quote, some sort of merger of biological intelligence and machine intelligence. And a few years ago, he founded a company called Neuralink that is developing an implantable chip allowing data from your brain to travel wirelessly to your digital devices. Um, you can watch the YouTube video demonstration with pigs from over the summer. Um, in addition, there's a lot of medical development. Um, so there's the artificial hippocampus, which is actually in phase two clinical trials with uh, Theodore Berger right now in his group. They've been working on it for 15 years. It's quite impressive. Um, DARPA, <laughs> they're working on all kinds of things to they say it for medical reasons, but I wonder if they'll make super soldiers. Hmm. Okay, Facebook. Um, unfortunately, I have time to talk about what Facebook's up to today, but I can fill you in at some other point. And then Colonel um, is also working on this kind of technology. It's all, it's all around us in the tech world, if you look for it, Google. Um, you may not be aware of it, though, because it's sort of up and coming and not the kind of thing that that Facebook is talking about or Google's talking about. Okay, now let me turn to design ceilings. So I'm a philosopher and I have lots of worries about these kinds of enhancements, but I'm only gonna talk about a few today um, because I just don't have a lot of time. Um, I'm going to be interested today in design ceilings, limits on human intelligence enhancement that aren't imposed by evolution or even by neurotechnology or AI. 
They're philosophical. Now, let me just say, though, of course, there will be scientific limits as well. But I'm going to talk about two philosophical ceilings today. First, I'm going to talk about a consciousness ceiling, which arises if microchips fail to underlie conscious experience. Second, I'll talk about a self ceiling. That's a point beyond which the person who attempts to enhance is no longer the same individual they were before because the procedure actually causes that person who sought en enhancement to actually cease to exist. Oops. So you pay money to go to the Center for Mind Design, but you never leave. Um, and I'll explain why shortly. I'll also say that um, I've also been interested in um, dystopian scenarios that are different from the ones I'm talking about today. So for example, um, I have a blog piece in one zero on this. Um, the, the issues involve um, concerns about data privacy. And since you're a data science group, this would be interesting to you. Um, so I suggest that there'll be a new thought data economy. Um, in fact, I just gave a talk at the University of Georgia on this. Um, so that's a concern I have. Um, and so it makes data regulation important on a whole new level. Um, and also I worry about uh, authoritarian dictatorships, that the kind of technology um, you know, that would involve thought policing in the hands of an authoritarian dictatorship would be a very bad technology. Um, that's just the tip of the iceberg. But today um, I'm gonna talk more about certain philosophical issues that involve consciousness and the self. Okay, that being said, so what is the consciousness ceiling? What am I talking about? Well, think about this. Okay, this is a picture I took back in the days when we could travel. Um, I think this is that bridge in Florence, Italy. I took the picture. It's not very good, but it reminds me of a fun time. Um, so here's what consciousness is. When you see the rich hues of a sunset or you smell the aroma of your morning espresso shot, it always feels like something to be you. Consciousness is that felt quality of inner experience. It's there all the time when you're awake. It always feels like something to be you. And even when you're dreaming, it's the felt quality of every second of your mental life. It's probably one of the most important things about our existence, right? I mean, without it, what would we be? Well, Richard Dawkins who we were both in a film together called Super Sapiens, The Rise of the Mind on these issues. And he made all kinds of, you know, pronouncements that were very quotable. So he said, I wish I could do the British accent. He said, it's not obvious to me that a replacement of our species by our own technological creations would necessarily be a bad thing. Well, in response to Dawkins, I pointed out that if non-conscious machines supplant biological intelligence, then the singularity would actually be a complete nightmare because it would mean the end of consciousness on Earth. So the issue of consciousness is actually extremely important to the future of AI when we're talking about AI-based brain enhancement. So here's the consciousness ceiling then, bearing all this in mind. What if you buy merge? Well, if AI isn't conscious, merging is a really bad idea. If microchips turn out to be the wrong stuff for consciousness, a mind machine merger can't happen. If you try, you lose consciousness. Your mind then would arguably not even exist anymore. That would be an in principle um, enhancement wall. Uh, human enhancement wouldn't be able to continue, at least in areas that underlie consciousness um, in the brain. So the neural basis of consciousness would be the limit for brain augmentation, the way that, you know, it would limit the transhumanist picture of the world, basically, of, of how we should enhance our minds. AI, in contrast, wouldn't hit this wall and it would be free to outpace us intellectually. Okay. That being said, um, let's suppose the consciousness ceiling doesn't arise, all right? And by the way, if you wanna hear more about the consciousness ceiling, um, if you Google my name in New York Times, I did an op-ed in the main paper on this issue recently. So suppose the consciousness ceiling doesn't arise. Should you buy merch then? Are you okay at the Center for Mind Design? Well, another issue arises, I'm sorry. 
In order to understand whether you should enhance, you need to actually think first about what you are. That is to say, what is a self or person? And would you continue to exist or would you have been replaced by someone or something else? Let me explain. I'll use an example because it's a very short talk. I'm not going to be able to go through all these slides. Believe it or not, my childhood friend is a world famous acquired savant uh, who fell down a ravine in Colorado. HBO is actually doing a special, special on her now. She doesn't remember anything before the accident. She doesn't even remember her own mother. Um, and she has new skills. So she didn't pass first grade. The Lee that I knew, her name's Lee, did not pass first grade, but now she is a physics expert. She's also a famous artist who has, um, she's represented by galleries in Laguna Beach, California, big money. I mean, she's doing quite well. Um, she's very smart. She sits around reading, not just the string theory literature, which is mathematically very intricate, but she also loves the philosophy literature on the nature of the self because of what happened to her. She believes she's no longer the same person. She believes the Lee Ersig that experienced the accident died the day of the accident and that she is an entirely new person now. These issues are arising today. So let's think about what happens if you radically alter your mental life at the Center for Mind Design. To understand the issue in a little more detail, consider the metaphysics of everyday objects like your espresso machine, if you will. Um, some features of the machine stop the machine from existing. Like if I take out my science fiction ray gun and decimate it. On the other hand, if I merely change the color, the same machine continues to exist. The properties that are essential for a thing to exist are called essential properties. Without them, the thing wouldn't continue to exist. So too with people. And there's a big philosophical debate about what those properties are. So the upshot is, even if enhancement brings super intelligence, it must not involve the elimination of any of your essential properties, because in that case, you wouldn't have merged with artificial intelligence. Because even if the technology works, the sharper mind would be experienced actually by someone or something else. OK, and as it turns out, there are many different theories of the nature of persons. I don't have time to go through them here. I do that in my book. But let me just say the self ceiling then is a point beyond which the person who attempts to enhance is no longer the same individual they were before because the procedure actually causes the individual who sought enhancement to no longer exist. And so if you wanted to think about whether you should enhance, you should probably think about whether you believe that the self is, say, the brain <laughs> or the brain and the nervous system, if it's intimately connected. Because if so, then you believe you are essentially your brain and perhaps elements of the body as well. And in that case, if you take out too much of your biological brain at the center, as the transhumanists argue, you're dead. You no longer exist, even if something leaves the center that looks like you. And there are other theories as well. Uh, you know, a famous theory, of course, is the soul view. And the transhumanists, they tend to think that you are something like an algorithmic pattern. And of course, my objection to them, I have a couple chapters in the book on this, is where does the pattern begin versus where does it end? What enhancements change the pattern so much that you cease to exist? Okay, so these are deep-seated philosophical issues. And um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to say what I suggest. I suggest what I call a stance of metaphysical humility in the book. Um, gradual biological enhancements, please. If you're going to do AI-based enhancements, know if there's a consciousness ceiling. Um, a safe approach is then to move forward with a, if you even want to enhance, a limited integration with AI. So what I like to call it is perhaps when you go to work, you get an intellectual exoskeleton, which adds, your, adds to your work tasks. Um, you just have to be more careful about replacing parts of the biological brain or changing your personality overnight in really radical ways so that your predicament is like my friend leads. My job then is to inform the public of the risks. Um, let me close with the big picture based on my work with NASA. So 
I think it's great that NASA has made me their chair uh, for the last year uh, and the, also the chair at the Library of Congress. And they've also, I've had now three years of projects with them on this, these kinds of topics. And you might wonder why NASA would care about this. Well, it's because they see this as involving the future of intelligence in the universe. If you think about it, if civilizations enhance and the most intelligent civilizations are AI based, then that says a lot for the future of intelligence should life exist elsewhere. Now, there's a lot of assumptions built into this. There's a whole chapter on this in my book. Um, but the basic idea is that I do defend the view that AI will outthink us, sorry. <laughs> and I do think that there may be life out there on these exoplanets, at least some of them. And it will be highly sophisticated. Earth is a relatively young planet. Uh, you know, the next closest um, civilization to us in age could be on order of 50,000 years ahead of us. That's just from the astrobiology textbooks, okay? Nothing novel. I'm not taking any novel assumptions. A lot of astrobiologists who, you know, work in this field, like, uh, you know, the former head of SETI, Seth Shostak, um, the well-known physicist Paul Davies, Martin Rees, uh, who's a royal astronomer, my, and then not so well-known myself, we all suggest that intelligence out there will actually be post-biological. The most intelligent civilizations will be post-biological. If that's true, then the issues I raise about design ceilings pertain to what's going on on these planets as well. Okay, so we're closing then with the sense of the cosmic, cosmic significance of the issue. The big picture takeaway then is humility. As Carl Sagan said in Contact, you're an interesting species, an interesting mix. You're capable of beautiful dreams and such horrible nightmares. Let's get the future of AI right. Technological prowess is not enough. To flourish, we need to appreciate the philosophical issues that lie beneath the algorithms. Thank you very much.